There was an FBI raid during the film. He did get raided by the FBI. That's in my film. I found the guy that did the security clearance for him. I found the guy that did the security clearance for him to be able to... A hand reader. And Jeremy, you found this. I, I found it. So I was able to reveal it in my film. You're going to hear and see things that are new evidence, new things that have happened over 30 years. It will change the landscape. So, Jeremy, how do you... I love when he talks about this shit. Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers is a uh, <coughs> documentary by Jeremy Corbell. It's supposedly the definitive telling of Bob Lazar's fascinating story. Sadly for Bob, Jeremy makes terrible films. He also has a strange relationship with the truth. Let's take a look. And unlike Jeremy Corbell, I will actually provide proof. <laughs> Imagine that as to why Jeremy's claims of new evidence are bullshit. For me, it was 1989 and Bob Lazar telling his story. That's what weaponized my curiosity about. My, my imagination has been weaponized. I, 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 again, I want your imagination to be weaponized. This, to weaponize your curiosity. That's my goal, to weaponize your curiosity. My curiosity was weaponized from that weaponization of my curiosity. And I really hope to weaponize people's curiosity. In the weaponized my curiosity. My curiosity was weaponized. I, I want to weaponize your curiosity. I have a weaponized curiosity like weaponized my my curiosity it may weaponize that first a bit about bob lazar bob is a physicist who in 1989 came out with a story about working near area 51 re-engineering supposed alien spacecraft the military had discovered years earlier crazy right he also tried to set up a brothel with his girlfriend still crazy his first wife turned up dead in a house that he would later live with his second wife crazy he was also married to both women at the same time yes bob lazar's story is fucking crazy true or false this is an interesting guy with an interesting story now i have no reason to doubt that he worked at area 51 or s4 which is the area he says this all happened i also believe he's a very smart dude that saw something weird but sadly bob lazar area 51 and flying saucers will not only add nothing new to the story it will actually damage it by either leaving out important information or straight out lying yes the main problem here is jeremy corbell now don't worry if you don't know jeremy you're gonna see a lot of him in this stocko and when i say a lot we will see him more than we see bob lazar this phone reenactment is 20 minutes alone of the film. That's no exaggeration. It really is. Oh man, check out those poses. Even though some documentary filmmakers include themselves in their films, there is usually a reason needing to confront individuals or simply they are part of the story. But the really great documentaries let the story come straight from the subject and it can pay off to listen. Kill them all, of course. Not Jeremy. Jeremy wants to be the star. So much so that the first six minutes of this film is taken up by Jeremy play acting in his bathroom. Yes, that's 20 minutes in the lounge room and a good six in the bathroom. Not only is the little play a confusing way to start your doco, where is your subject, Jeremy? It's not supposed to be you. It's linked to a lie. The famous raid. He did get raided by the FBI. An FBI raid that wasn't what it all appears. Now, I know filming in your bathroom is a lot easier than actually going out and investigating the story but once you've set up your little light with the pink gel and you've pulled off those poses make sure you've changed the date on your fake messages now, I know is the incoming message time different to the phones. It's a completely different date. He changed the phone time to suit his story, but not the messages. I mean, it's only the start of your film, Jeremy, and supposedly an important detail, but fuck it. The other agenda was to uplift the visual medium of filmmaking in this genre, which I did. That's a big statement. Maybe recreating a Soundgarden clip from 1991 is lifting the game. Hold the fuck on. Hold the fuck on. But what I didn't do is I didn't make an ancient aliens bullshit thing where I try to nope. show you some stupid fucking image and be like, oh, that's fucking it. The films I'm putting out, although they're not force feeding you some bullshit spooky movie kind of grainy footage stuff, what I am providing you is the real story. You liar. It is full of this shit. Yes, of all the people Jeremy's convinced of Mickey Rourke to what he calls narrate the film. Beliefs are material things. To crack a life open and it seems like the reading of omens by viewing the intros. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? And by narration, he means saying random shit that is not only impossible to understand, but has zero to do with Bob's story. Now, Jeremy is no wordsmith on his own. Imagine a place between shadow and substance. What does that mean? Why waste time, say lot word, when few word do trick? 
But he is super pumped to have Mickey Rourke on board. Give him some space, man. Ha! <laughs> Same billing. Now remember, Mickey was the good-looking, talented actor who decided to go into boxing. And well, let's just say, not the best outcome. <laughs> So of course the guy that's been hit in the head way too many times should narrate. Maybe they'd like our condors and cupcakes, the kimono or the top hat, who the fuck knows. Fuck, he sounds like he's had a lobotomy. Wait, what's that scar? <laughs> My mistake. Everything's normal. Before we get into Jeremy's problem with the truth, let's look at what Jeremy believes. My documentaries are investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a investigative filmmaking. I want to know the truth as much as you do. I identify myself as an investigative filmmaker. Jeremy's been selling this for years. The idea that he truly investigates and wants to get to the truth. He wants you to think his film will actually teach you something new. You know, I want to know too. If this is true, I think that it's either true or it's not true. I want their critical, rational minds. So really what I want you to take away from it is use your logic, your reason, your optimistic skepticism. Is Bob Lazar telling us the truth. I wanted to know the truth about Bob. Is he worthy of our trust? The lie here is that he is a total believer and he has been from a young age. He questions nothing, does next to no investigating and he believes whatever he is told. So really, I was 13 years old and on the radio I heard the famous Bob Lazar. 13 years old, 1989, mm -hmm. and I hear Bob. But, but there has been contact. I, I do not have the luxury of disbelief. Why do you think these people who can build these superior things haven't come here? But they have come here. Whether you like it or not, it's real. Science has finally caught up, and we know that life is homogenous throughout the universe. This is really happening. Mm -hmm. It's been happening for a long time, since the beginning of recorded human history. Why don't they come to New York? Right, so they do, go, <laughs> they do come to New York. But UFOs are real. Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's real. These intelligences are controlling whatever these are, if they're craft or whatever. They have made themselves clearly available. You know, they haven't come on your show yet, Larry, but let's get that to happen. Jeremy doesn't restrict himself to just UFOs and aliens. He's into the whole mixed bag. Creatures, I know this is weird, crawling out of what appear to be inverted geometric fucking portholes on the ranch. Interdimensional portholes, a place where the world is thin, a veil that's perforated where these things start to come into our dimension. And poltergeist, poltergeist and Bigfoot, Bigfoot and cattle mutilations. The rancher placed a new flea collar on his dog's neck. It disappeared within a day. Now, Jeremy doesn't bring a lot that's new to Bob's story, but what he does bring seems at first First interesting, that's until you look slightly deeper and realize he lies. You were telling people since 1989 that there was some sort of hand scanner. They have a, a hand reader. I was told that it has to do something where it measures the, the bright light measures the bones. When you discuss this, people are like, this doesn't even exist. Yeah. I looked for that kind of thing all over the internet, never found anything. They said it was bullshit, it was, sci it was science fiction, and Jeremy, you found this. I, I found it, so I was able to reveal it in my film. I never thought I'd see one of these again. <laughs> it is touching after 30 years, when no one will believe Bob, Jeremy hands him photos of this very hand scanner, printed off the internet onto photo paper, so Jeremy can pretend that they are original photos. Sweet, sweet moment. I can't believe you found a picture of this. But I tried to explain this to people so many times and they either didn't believe me or say, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there is. Now, I'd hate to shine a light on Jeremy's investigative skills, but between Bob and the investigative filmmaker, someone might have noticed that this very scanner was used in one of the biggest sci-fi films of all time. <laughs> Close encounters of the third kind. And it's not in the background. A nice big shot of them using the scanner. Four rapid pulses after a five second interval, 40 pulses. Another five second break and 30 pulses. 60 seconds of silence and then an entirely new set of numbers. 40 break. It's exactly, exactly how it was. This film came out in 1977, 12 years before Bob's claims, when he was 18. It was up for eight Academy Awards, 42 friggin' years ago. To Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Now true, I don't know if Bob has ever seen Close Encounters. Sad for him if he hasn't, could have really shut up those people that didn't believe him all along. Bob does seem like the type of guy that would rather be out driving rocket cars, shooting guns, building hydrogen cars, opening brothels and generally blowing shit up than sitting at home watching movies. So maybe he missed the massive film that came out when he was in his teens about alien contact with the exact same hand scanner. Maybe he never caught it on video either. I tell you, if I had been trying to describe something for 30 years and it popped up on my TV, I 
I'd fucking notice. But what about our little grey furball? He has been following this hand scanner story since he was 13. Has he seen Close Encounters? If only there was an interview where he was talking about Close Encounters as being one of his favourite films. If only they'd asked him how many times he'd seen it. How many times have you seen the film Close Encounters? I mean, is this, this is a test? Probably too many? What was that, Jeremy? Probably too many? Too many times? And you never noticed the hand scanner. Investigative filmmaker? Obviously, as one was used in a major movie, these scanners were not that rare. Yes, they were used as part of the stealth program, but they were also advertised in the early 70s for other commercial uses. Jeremy can't even keep his own story straight. In this film, he states he found them online, which is probably true. I looked for that kind of thing all over the internet, never found anything. And then all of a sudden this article comes out. On the Joe Rogan show, he says he got them from a friend that works at Area 52, which is a straight out lie. Found it through a good friend of mine named Tyler Rogaway, and he had some good sources inside of Area 52. Stick to your story, Jeremy. The FBI raided during the film. There was an FBI raid during the film. He did get raided by the FBI. That's in my film. During filming on the 19th of July, Bob Lazar's business, United Nuclear, was raided by the FBI, along with several other departments. Oh my God. FBI identified themselves. The bomb squad, uh, computer squad, biological hazard squad, hazmat squad, everything made the full gamut. We were told that this raid was triggered by a conversation Jeremy and Bob had the day before on the 18th of July in a secret location. Apparently, this conversation was amazing and included info that no one has ever heard before. Well, they still haven't heard it because we are never shown any of that conversation. A conversation that was built up from the beginning of Jeremy's film. Remember Jeremy play acting at the start? That's right. Like a lot of this film, we are just going to have to take Jeremy's word on it. What the fuck are you doing? They, they, they were able to repeat back verbatim a portion of the conversation that we thought were, was private. As the name implies, United Nuclear isn't your run-of-the-mill business. Just the look of that 90s website will send a shiver up your spine. United Nuclear sells some serious shit. Looking for some uranium? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Bob has also been raided before, where charges were laid against him and his wife for selling illegal items. We are told in the film that it was conducted under the guise of a missing receipt. And what they said, they were looking for some paperwork, an old order from two years ago. What they were looking for was just a, an order form. Well, they said they were looking for some receipts. For but Jeremy and Bob don't believe this. What do you think they were there for? For some of the fuel from the craft that might have been stolen. Element 115 was always something Bob said fueled the craft. Interestingly, the truth could be a lot scarier than that. The FBI investigating a murder where the victim, Janelle Sturzel, was poisoned with thallium, a substance that is banned in the United States. Now, Bob isn't a suspect for the murder, but he is one of the very few people that could make thallium. As far as their secret conversation on the 18th of July triggering the raid, the search warrant and raid details were logged in the day before their secret conversation. On the 17th of July, the murder is real, the investigation is real. Squad, ever made the full gamut because they had no idea um, what we had in our shop or like what we're capable of or are we going to retaliate or anything like that. Was the raid time to send a message to Bob and Jeremy because they were making the film? Maybe. But again, we will never know the truth because this lazy little garden gnome is not interested in finding the truth. Even if that truth would help explain or verify Bob's story. Jeremy, you could have at least approached either the FBI or the local police to get some clarification on what they were looking for. Maybe you could have proved the FBI's story was fake. Oh <laughs> my kidding? He doesn't give a fuck. My documentaries are investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an investigative filmmaking. I want to know the truth as much as you do. <laughs> Briefings, and they just sat me in a room and they had a, uh, while they were going and updating my clearance to a level that they call majestic. After 30 years, Jeremy has finally found the mysterious Mike Thigpen. Found the guy that did the security clearance for him in 1989. Was it difficult to find these individuals? You know, Facebook is a, is a heck of a thing. Is that you know? <laughs> I found the guy that did the security clearance for him to be able to work at the base. The guy nobody could find for 30 years. How'd you find him? Uh, Facebook. Mike Thigpen supposedly did the background checks on Bob Lazar for clearance to work at S4. After 30 years, and this guy dodging you, I found Mike Thigpen. That's amazing. I couldn't believe it. it he's, he's on the East Coast. I called him. I've talked with him multiple times. You know, he won't go on camera. Surprisingly, Mike doesn't want to appear on camera or on the phone or by text or by email. That's right. Again, Jeremy has zero proof of what he's telling us. Where is the footage of Jeremy calling him? Where is the footage of him finding him on Facebook? He actually talked to me, man. He talked to me three times. He almost went on camera with me. Why didn't Bob talk to him? Are you an incompetent filmmaker or just full of <laughs> shit? But the number one thing you need in this field as an investigative filmmaker, the number one thing, yeah, 
You have to have a huge fucking bullshit meter. The premiere of this new film has fired up many of the same arguments about his credibility, but the first audience to see the movie didn't need much convincing. Eager fans stretched around a city block to see a film narrated by movie star Mickey Rourke. Audience response to the film's premiere was overwhelmingly positive. Because I provided input to the director, my name is listed in these movie credits, but this is Jeremy Corbell's film. I hope your name's in the credits. It's your film. You fucking produced it. Nice free plug there, George. George Knapp is the reporter who started the whole Bob Lazar story. To say Jeremy has had a chubby little grey bone of him for years is an understatement. My mentor in journalism is a man named George Knapp. Also working with my mentor in journalism, George Knapp, who is now my mentor in journalism, George Knapp. And I went to my mentor, George Knapp. My mentor in journalism, a man named George Knapp. Here's my mentor in journalism, George Knapp. I want to honor my mentor because my mentor is George Knapp. And my mentor in journalism, George Knapp. The voice of my mentor in journalism, George Knapp. My mentor is George Knapp. My mentor in journalism, George Knapp. He, he's my mentor in journalism. Yeah, not everybody can be George Knapp. Fucking yeah. that guy's a gangster. This isn't even their first film together. You could say George has found the perfect little groupie to continue his work. The fact that for over 30 years, George hasn't been able to clear up much of Bob Lazar's story doesn't put off Jeremy in the slightest. Middle of the night, middle of nowhere, and a place that where the uh, monster, uh, the predator type monster had appeared, where a giant dark cloud had invaded a, a physicist's mind. Like his little apprentice Jeremy, George isn't the greatest at handling evidence. In fact, George has a videotape of the elusive Element 115. Yes, I know, I can't wait to see it. Only problem is, George lost it before anyone else could see it. I get a lot of emails from people who say, oh God, where's this video? You owe it to the world to show this video, cough it up. And I tell him, look, I've looked for it. I've got all these boxes of crap. But don't worry, Jeremy has been telling everyone he has finally found it. Show us, Jeremy. Show us what's on that tape. I went through every tape that Bob had in his personal home archive. And after all these years, 30 years, we have some footage of it, but it doesn't prove shit. Useless. <laughs> <laughs> Side note on element 115, in 1989, Scientific America did a story on the possibilities of creating element 115. There's a probably a good chance Bob was interested in this magazine. That story was published in May of that year, just two weeks before Bob came forward with his amazing story. Man, what a coincidence. Now, to be fair, I thought I should watch another one of Jeremy's films in case this was his only bad one. Oh look, George Knapp again. Now incredibly, Hunt for the Skinwalker is actually much much worse. The flea collar on his dog's neck, it disappeared within a day. 24 hours later, it was back on the dog. I know, how? Well, it doesn't have Bob Lazar, who was at least interesting, but it does have Robbie Williams for some strange reason. It does also have the best proof that Jeremy is the Tommy Wazoo of docos. Sorry, Tommy, you are at least entertaining. Jeremy decides to pretend to interview himself in his own documentary. The best part is he can't answer one of his own questions. I don't know, man. That's why I would never, ever take illegal drugs. You know, I've seen some people who smoke marijuana, and they seem to lose pride in their appearance. They lose their motivation to achieve. Strip away the lies, the twisting of the story, the selfie footage, the stock footage, and all you're left with is a 30-year-old story with zero added. You realize once again that America's leading industry, America's most profitable business, is still the manufacture, packaging, distribution, and marketing of bullshit. Is Bob telling the truth? I didn't know before, and thanks to Jeremy, I still don't know. It would only be fitting to finish this wonderful video with some wise, wise words from the wonderful Mr. Mickey Rourke. Crack a life open and it seems like the reading of omens by viewing the entrails. We tell them one last time. time. Maybe they'd like our condoms and cupcakes, kimono, or top of the This is great. <laughs>